on time here. Again, my name is Ihab Dawood, and my topic that I chose to start with is advanced monitoring during mechanical ventilation. Should we look at the other side? Um, so this is actually um, a very big presentation. We have one hour, but I'll, I'll try to go through them kind of quickly. I chose those topics, uh, electrical impedance tomography, superficial balloon manometry, and volumetric capnometry. Um, those are not new technologies by any, you know, uh, any meaning, because they have been, most of them are from the 70s. Actually, volumetric capnometry might be from like 60s too. The problem is uh, we really don't use them at the bedside enough. Uh, they're mostly been in research, but if you look over the last 10 years, actually they're, they're picking up and uh, making their ways to the bedside, which is uh, great. So my goal from this presentation is uh, briefly talk about them, their technology, how to use them, and some uh, ways that we can benefit from them. Um, and my goal is personalized mechanical ventilation. So not everybody um, should be in six milliliter per kg or uh, 15 centimeter of driving pressure. We give the patient what they need without causing or reducing the ventilator induced lung injury. So if you're a Batman fan, you know who this. This is uh, Harvey Dent um, with his handsome right face. Oh, should be uh, a surprise at the end. Anyway. Um, we basically what we're looking usually during mechanical ventilation is on the left side, the ventilator waveforms. We see the pre airway pressure, the flow, the volume. And if you look at that person here, driving pressure 15, tidal volume probably less than three mil uh, six milliliter per kg. Um, so you would think, okay, we're doing great. We're protecting that patient. Um, we're good. Now let's look at that bad side of that other patient. And we'll talk about everything in detail. If you look at his EIT to the right, electrical impedance tomography on the right top, you would find that his right lung is so over distended despite low tidal volume, and his left lung is like almost collapsed. Let's look at the bottom one, the autophagial balloon, and you will find that his end expiratory transpulmonary pressure, again, we'll talk about this, the, the yellow line is in the negative. Then if you look at his volumetric capnometry, you will notice that he has a very dead, big dead space. And basically, based on this information, we could change our management, which we wouldn't have changed it just by looking at the ventilator waveforms. And ventilator waveforms are great. We, maybe we don't spend enough time analyzing them, but we learn a lot from them. In my opinion, they are not enough. So what is electrical impedance tomography? Um, it's basically a belt with electrodes, electric uh, electrodes, usually about 16 to 32. Uh, you put them and strap them on the chest at between the fifth and sixth intercostal space, and they send electrical impulses uh, two at a time, as you can see that video, and the other 30 or the rest of the 14 detect them, convert them into an image, almost looks like a CAT scan image. So it gives you uh, an image, active image, inspiration and expiration uh, during each breath. So this is another video, basically what it looks like. And sorry, it's supposed to play automatically. Okay, sorry, it's not uh, it's not working. Anyway, so this hmm? oh, it's working outside. Okay, working for the virtual people. Sorry. Um, basically, what it does during inspiration and expiration, you would find this blue air going in and coming out, going in and coming out. And the cool thing, if you look, this is called the ventilation map. There is so many different maps uh, we'll talk about. But this basically, if you look at the top one, it said anteroposterior to the anterior part of the lung. Oh, here it is. Okay. 
that was that was embarrassing. Uh, <laughs> okay, you can see. of the tidal volume, the posterior part of the lung is getting 55% of the tidal volume. It also divided for you right and left, so you can see that the right lung is getting 60% of the tidal volume, the left lung is getting 40%. And then it gives you different color codes. Uh, the problem is there is almost, I think, four or five different uh, commercial EITs. Uh, each one gives totally different colors. So one gives blue and white, one gives orange. Um, we only have one in the US, um, so you have to know, of course, your machine. So if you look at the bottom here, you'll find something called the seismography, and this is, again, we'll, we'll talk about it. It's basically almost to measure the tidal volume. Okay, so if you look at the literature, um, again, there's so many indices that they use when they describe electrical impedance tomography, to the point is, and they are not um, all accepted by all, you know, some are still in development, some are in some machines and some are not, so it's not unified. Yet. And I know there are some people trying to unify the terms of electrical impedance tomography, the same with mechanical ventilation, it's the same problem. Everybody just discover an index and put a name uh, on it and then we clinicians get uh, lost. But you'll find something called ventilation map, global ventilation, fusion map, ROI, COV, global inhomogeneity, I'm going to talk about some of those a little bit. So what is uh, the plasmography? Um, I want to tell you, like, the EIT does not measure exactly the tidal volume. It just goes, it shows you in and out. But through algorithms, they try to measure the tidal volume. And they call it here change Z, uh, which is here arbitrary unit. And through algorithms, they can tell you about the, um, the tidal volume, almost equivalent to the tidal volume. There is something also called the EELZ, which is in the bottom here, EELZ. That's like basically the end expiratory lung volume. So it tried to measure for you. So when you do your maneuver like this person, he was in PEEP of zero, you increase the PEEP up to 10, and you can see like that tidal volume. I'm just going to call it tidal volume for the Delta Z. It increased, and they kept going up on the PEEP, I think, up to like 15. And you can see the difference that the end expiratory lung volume is increasing, which is the thing that you want to do with PEEP, basically improve your functional residual capacity. Um, so this is one of, again, of the, uh, of the ways that you can uh, help check your PEEP or position. Um, importantly, again, we don't think about, when we think about our lung and this patient's ARDS, whatever, we always call it compliant, low compliance, high resistance, thinking that just our lung is one balloon, but of uh, course, it's not. So there is a lot of uh, inhomogeneity, um, uh, especially in lung disease, but even in normal lung, our healthy lung is not homogeneous. So if you can look at this person who's lying on his right dependent lung, you can see here he was doing normal, normal tidal breathing. Uh, so you can see the change Z, or we, we'll just agree that it's supposed to be a tidal volume. Then he stopped breathing, so he's becoming apneic. And you can see that, that his tidal volume uh, is dropping. The end expiratory lung volume is dropping. Then he starts taking deep breaths, and of course, again, his lung is, is opening again. Ver the same person, this is now on the left side, is the left non-dependent lung. The patient is doing the same thing. Here he's quiet breathing, and I can see, you can tell the difference. Um, when he does apnea, when he stopped breathing, if you can see, is actually end expiratory lung volume doesn't drop at all versus the right dependent lung that drops. Then when he starts taking deep breaths, again, the, the non-dependent lung um, does not increase. So it gives you a really great idea about the situation of our lung. So I want to show you, first of all, I should have said that before, the picture that you get with EIT is almost similar to a CAT scan. So you're thinking that you're standing behind at the legs of the patient, so right is left and left is right. Um, and this is to compare it with the CAT scan of a patient who mostly have a unilateral lung disease. So the right bottom lung here, right lower lobe, you can see it's totally consolidated. Um, and that's what EIT gives you. So you can tell here at the, um, the left cor corner here that this person is not getting any air. No air is going in and out while he's breathing. And if you look at the left lung, 
this is actually an index of like the patients. Actually, the left lung is getting most of the tidal volume. So there is all over distension in, in this lung. So whatever we're doing with this patient, we're basically and on the left lung, we're over distending it, closing it. So we're doing like double, double hit. Um, if you look again, the plasmography on the top here, this is the global one. Then the ones, uh, you can tell which one is the right lower lobe, right? It's number four, here, the flat. There is no air going in and out. Uh, so whenever you're doing your maneuvers, like whatever it is, increasing peep, doing recruitment, changing position, you should aim, like, am I improving those problems or, or I'm not? Another one um, sign of inhomogeneity uh, called the pendulum uh, phenomena. Uh, basically, especially in people with ARDS, you start taking deep breaths, the upper lungs get filled and then get pushed down to the uh, bottom lungs. Pendulum phenomena, which could be very injurious, actually, or could be injurious. So in that person, uh, you can see again, the beginning of the breath starts in the top, in the apical part or the anterior part, Keep going down, 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 and you can see over this tension. Then you adjusted the peep. This is a guy who was having a better homogeneity of the lung, and you can see the breath starts almost on all the four lobes at the same time. So again, look at this, do your maneuvers, whatever they are, and adjust them, and you should get aim for better uh, lung homogeneity. One of the important things that most of the studies talk um, of course, we have the elephant in the room in any ventilated patient is the PEEP and how much we set the PEEP. And I'm sure you're going to be a lot of lectures talking about PEEP uh, and it will pop up regardless. But one of the nice things about EIT is, as we talked, if you look at the right uh, on that uh, left curve, the white line, that's an index of over distension. So it gives you percentage over distension. And then the blue line, that's um, index of collapse, how many alveoli are collapsed. And the orange one is the elasticity or the compliance of the system. So if you look at the pictures, this person, they started at peak of almost 24. Yeah, at a decremental peak. So you can see the long, especially on the right side, is so over distended. Then they could start coming down on the peak, down on the peak. When they reached around 13 or I'm sorry, 16 here, which is like the, on the right side, you can see the over distension is decreasing, the white uh, thing. And then when they go to 13, the, you can start seeing collapse. So basically you drop the peep, uh, you start getting collapse. So where am I gonna set my peep here? The ideal is that intersection of the over distension white line where it's intersecting with the blue line, which is the uh, collapse. Interesting enough, if you look at the compliance, usually we set PEEP for the best compliance. Problem is, if you can see those, those didn't intersect, like the best PEEP here, according to the compliance, is like about, I think, 16, where that intersection line is a little bit lower. Um, so you have to choose at some point, what that, because the, again, the long is very non-homogeneous, you will have to accept a little bit over extension in some parts and some uh, collapse in some parts. I don't think you can. Um, again, one of the ways, again, to set PEEP was the same thing. So this guy was in PEEP of five with ARDS. You can see that 75% of the, of the tidal volume is going to the anterior parts and the 25% in the lower lobes. Then when you adjusted the PEEP up to 15, you can see they become almost equal, 52% of the One of the cool things about, uh, uh, about EIT, it doesn't only give you uh, ventilation. Through, again, different techniques, one of them is called uh, cold saline. You inject 10 cc cold saline. And some of them, it's, this is still under, uh, not FDA approved, it's not in the US yet, but there's a lot of work about it. You can measure the perfusion of the lung. So you're getting the air, the ventilation part. Now you can, in that red part, you can get the perfusion of the lung. And the same thing, if you look, this is the ventilation map on the top, and you can see uh, my left upper lobe is getting 18%, my left lower lobe is getting 35% of the blood volume, left lower lobe 35, and stuff like that. 
So you can actually, we always talk about ventilation perfusion matching. Um, this is basically a great way to tell you the ventilation perfusion uh, ratio or matching. Instead, we assume it's always and everybody's the same. So, um, so this is. Low one, the right lower low, the right lower lobe is not getting much air. And what you're expecting because of our normal response vasoconstriction, that you shouldn't be getting a lot of blood, which is perfect. So this is a good ventilation perfusion match. Look at the person on the right side. So this guy has a PE. You have very good uh, ventilation, and there is this in the uh, right upper lobe. There is no perfusion. So when you, if you have this strap on the patient, we always think once the patient gets in shock, hypoxia, it's always a question, is it PE? Is it PE? Because we get CT scan, patients are sick and stuff. If you have this, you might give you the answer and you don't need the CT scan uh, or anything. So I think this is great for the hemodynamics. So it's just I wanted to show you that this is not just about the lung. It just gives you more information about the stuff. Um, now, again, new technology. Some people here um, published this paper a couple of years ago. They were able actually to measure the cardiac output, stroke volume, cardiac output, ejection fraction um, based on EIT. So we're talking now, like when we get an echo or put a pulmonary artery catheter, this is beat by beat through uh, cardiac output. Again, still needs a lot of work. It's not uh, approved yet, but it will be coming. So. All right, this is just some of the evidence. You just intubated the patient. Um, the patient is hypoxic. You're listening. I was like, I don't hear anything on the right or in the left. What's happening, right? Let's get an x-ray. You call the x-ray. They come after 10 minutes. Now you're begging the patient. And so if you just have the EIT, you can tell that that guy is the right lung is so over distended and the left lung is almost getting no air whatsoever. So, and you can see the plethysmography. Uh, um, so what you do is you suspect that you write in, uh, right mean stem intubation. So you start pulling the ET tube up, up, and up, and you can see the small images. Now the lung, both lungs are getting air. Instead of it was 98% the right lung, 2% the left lung, now it's like 57. So one very cool way fast that you don't even need an X-ray. Okay, one of the other complications we always happen, uh, not always, I mean, hopefully, not always, is pneumothorax. Right? And we all went, to, is that a pneumothorax? Let's get an X-ray, same, blah, blah, blah. Uh, or let's get an echo, let's do an ultrasound. Um, sometimes you need to be proficient in ultrasound to, to really diagnose uh, P, um, pneumothorax. But if you look at that person here, um, the ventilation map is okay. This is called an air, uh, aeration change map, basically a reference from the original baseline to what's happening. And this guy in the CAT scan here, he has right upper uh, pneumothorax, and you can see that, you can, I guess you can appreciate the difference between the top one and the uh, bottom one in the blue, and in the bot top one and the bottom one in the aeration chain. All of a sudden, there is no air going to that right upper lobe um, after I put the symptom. Okay, this is again, uh, we always talk about proning and how proning improves uh, homogeneity of the lung and lung recruitment, et cetera, et cetera. But we know also that not every per person that you're going to prone, they will they will recruit the lung. Catinoni, I think, said that like 30 years ago. Um, so through EIT, um, this is like if you look here to the left, this was before proning. This is three uh, one hour after proning, three hours, blah, blah. And you can see the lung on the top here. This is a person who benefited and recruited from uh, the proning and the bottom one didn't. So again, one of the examples how EIT can help you when you prone a patient, oh, he's not, he's, it's not helping him or whatever. So, do I need to keep him prone for like you know another 16, 18 hours if his lung didn't respond or didn't recruit? Um, one quick thing, which is like asynchrony. Um, of course, we will talk in details later on about asynchronies, but this is a quick one. I wanted to show you. Um, if you look at that first in uh, in the white circle, this is a normal quiet tidal breath. You can see the tidal volume, right? Then in that red circle, this is probably double trigger. Um, and you can see, you feel like, oh, I set my tidal volume at six milliliters. You would only appreciate that 
and that one before it and that one the tidal volume is double so that's why we think asynchronous are dangerous and cause long injury um, but again we always see it on the on the um, uh, graphics low and the pressure but we don't appreciate what's happening inside the lung when this asynchronous right we call them all the patients bucking the vent um, okay Just have thinking. I'm going to try to give you some evidence um, for the use of uh, at least electrical impedance tomography before we move on. This is um, a small study from uh, Mass General. They published a couple of years ago. Um, it's based on rescue team protocol. I want to tell you whatever the results are not just because of EIT. It's not one arm EIT, one arm your normal settings. No, they used PEEP recruitment maneuvers, decremental PEEP. Some of them had gel balloons, some had uh, EIT. So whatever the results I'm telling you, it's not just because of EIT. And they found compared to this rescue team versus the normal, mortality rate dropped by 50%. Uh, no need for ECMO, avoid ECMO 80%. Shorter duration of mechanical ventilation, shorter ICU length of stay, decreased inotropic agents. Um, you know, to be honest with you, when you look at those results, you can tell that this is too good to be true. Um, like, yeah, when you reduce mortality by 50%, I mean, God bless you. So, um, yeah, we're looking, we'll be happy if we reduce mortality by like 5%. Okay, so this is probably like almost this very similar study to the, um, to the rescue team also. Uh, but they looked at reducing the venu, venous extracorporeal membrane oxygenation. And if you notice here, I highlighted it in yellow, all what they found is, reduce amount of ECMO utilization uh, and duration of mechanical ventilation. No change in mortality or anything. Um, again, the studies are just about picking up in the last, I would say, five, seven years. So by time, we're going to see more evidence, hopefully. Um, this is another study, actually, cool study, where they compared really setting the PEEP according uh, to the electrical impedance tomography versus your normal um, uh, PEEP FIO2 table, um, which you would think like I would be a uh, proponent of yes, that's the way to do. Unfortunately, what you can see in the Captain Meyer curves here in the left lower lobe, uh, sorry, in the left lower corner, that there was no mortality difference whatsoever. Um, the only um, difference they found is the change of SOFA score between day one and day um, three or something was less. So honestly, I would call this a negative study. Um, again, this was not as a small, small study. All right, with that, I'm just going to jump on to the next topic, which is very close to my heart, esophageal uh, balloon manometry. And apparently, I am old enough when I was a resident 20 years ago that we used to do it with an external um, pressure monitoring, and you try to print it on paper, even ventilators at that time, honestly, didn't even have airway pressures screens. So I have no idea actually what we were looking at. We're getting some pressures, but you don't compare. Now life is much better because you have everything in front of your eyes and it, the computers, the ventilators calculates it for you. So we try to use it. Um, you, we don't use it, of course, in every patient, but we try to use it and I'll tell you why. So I'm sure you all know that, again, that's a special manometry from the 70s. Um, this is where it's the white thing was supposed to sit in the lower uh, third of the esophagus. Uh, some balloons come with a gastric uh, balloon and esophageal port. I think the one in the U.S. only comes with esophageal part. So it's supposed to sit behind the heart in the lower third of the chest. This is we're going to talk about um, what's the terms that we're going to use uh, for esophageal balloon manom. And there is some confusion, but I will just want to go quickly about it. The airway pressure PA uh, airways, that's the pressure related to atmospheric pressure. Um, this PA only, which is in the blue box, so that's the alveolar pressure. And the green one is the PPL, or the pleural pressure. What we're interested in, and of course you have the abdominal pressures and the lungs and stuff. Um, we're looking at transalveolar pressure difference, which is the, would be the difference between the alveolar pressure and the pleural pressure. Now, most of the, the um, 
uh, articles and books and everything describe it as transpulmonary pressure. I even say always transpulmonary pressure, whether end inspiratory or end expiratory. The idea is just to not cause confusion when you doing the pauses, inspiratory pause or expiratory pause, that's a static uh, way. So the transalveolar pressure will be equal to the transpulmonary pressure. So people always. Um, again, this is uh, when we talk about it, this is the equation of motion, I think very, very important uh, to understand during mechanical ventilation. Um, and most of like whatever we are learning from mechanical ventilation is derived from that equation, which is derived from Newton. Um, I'm not going to go through it exactly, but I just want to let you know that the airway pressure that's applied is a combination between the patient, the mass, and the, uh, the ventilator, the P-vent, unless, of course, the patient is paralyzed, and, you know, uh, get extubated, so it's only the ventilator. So you have to overcome uh, resistance, and you have to overcome elastance, and you have to overcome PEEP. So when you convert everything to pressures, become that equation. So PEEP, uh, pressure total equal flow times resistance plus volume over elastance plus total PEEP. All right, so how are we going to know that the oesophageal balloon, then, you know, if we work together, uh, you probably know that sometimes it becomes a struggle and, you know, it doesn't go into the oesophagus and after 15, 20 minutes, people start cursing as like it's not going, it's coming from the mouth and whatever. So uh, anyway, assume that it went smoothly, went into, usually you put it down to 50, 60 centimeter in the stomach, push, you make sure then you start retracting. And again, you want it to be behind the heart at usually about, normal person 35, 40 centimeters. So if the patient is passive to make sure, you should see first of all some artifacts of the heart, meaning the balloon is good and transmitting uh, the heart. And when you little bit push during a pause, the airway pressure and the oesophageal pressure go up to almost 1%. It's really important to know that we are in the correct position, because if you're not correct position, you, you didn't put enough volume, the numbers will be messed up and we might be misguided. So sometimes it takes a lot of work and those balloons deflate. Sometimes you have to keep inflating, deflating. If the patient is actively breathing and he's sucking in, so you put an expiratory pause, the patient sucks against the closed belt, causing this airway pressure, the oesophageal pressure should again mirror. And I should have said, why are we interested in oesophageal pressure? Because it's a surrogate of the pleural pressure. Unfortunately, it's not exactly the plural pressure, unless you put, um, of course, a, a pressure manometer into the long, into the plural, which you don't want to do that. So it's the closest thing to do uh, to measure the plural. That's a transpulmonary pressure that we talked about. So if you look up here, uh, that's the regular airway pressure. Now this is the oesophageal pressure. Looks beautiful. Uh, you can see the artifacts, and you can see it goes up when the airway pressure goes up. So that patient is passive, he's not doing any effort, probably paralyzed. Uh, if the patient was active, you would see just before the airway pressure, the oesophageal pressure should dip in, meaning the patient has triggered the ventilator. And by subtracting the oesophageal pressure from the airway pressure, you're ending up with the transpulmonary pressure, which we talk about. Why is this important? We always look at the plateau pressure, right? And the guidelines tell you, Keep the plateau pressure below 30, whatever. Um, I will show you later that sometimes it's okay to have a plateau pressure of 45, 50. And you're supposedly not causing lung injury. Um, we, if you look at the top one of the airway pressures, of course, the difference between the plateau pressure and the PEEP is the driving pressure or the tidal pressure. Um, then we're looking at the end inspiratory uh, transpulmonary pressure in the bottom, the green one, and the end expiratory transpulmonary pressure in the bottom. And the difference between them is actually uh, the transpulmonary driving pressure. So that is the pressure that the really the lung is seeing. The top one, the airway pressure, is inflating the lung, inflating the chest wall, inflating the abdomen. Um, so it's really misleading. Are we interested in the chest wall? Probably not. Uh, we're interested in lung injury, so the, what the pressures that transmitted to the to the lung, um, and we'll talk about it in a little bit. 
Uh, this is an article from our journal. Uh, how can artificial balloon help you? It can compare to mice. Uh, we always talk about lung mechanics, respiratory mechanics, and compliance is pressure over, sorry, volume over pressure, um, and know how to do it. But again, we are interested again about, are we interested about the chest wall compliance? Yes, I want to know what's my total respiratory compliance, which is based on lung compliance and chest wall compliance. So I want to know each one's different. So by having an osophageal you're able to not only compliance but resistance. So I'm just going to give you an example. Don't go through all the calculations here. Um, if you look total respiratory compliance, we have a tidal volume of almost 500 on the airway. We have a plateau pressure of 27. Uh, the PEEP is 15. So the total compliance is 41.6. Let's do the chest wall compliance. So the chest wall compliance would be the difference between the end inspiratory esophageal pressure or the pleural pressure minus the end expiratory esophageal pressure. And if you look at the top here, there is no much really difference. So uh, the chest wall compliance would be again tidal volume uh, over end inspiratory esophageal pressure my, uh, minus end expiratory esophageal pressure. So 500 over 17 minus 12 equal 100, which looks pretty good. How about the long that we're more interested in? So the long will be again the, the difference between uh, the plateau and the inspiratory transpulmonary pressure over minus the end expiratory transpulmonary pressure or the driving pressure of the lung. I know it gets confusing a little bit, but you have to kind of like remember and think about. It. So in that person, his tidal volume is 500. The difference between the end inspiratory and end expiratory transpulmonary pressure is 70. So you're ending what was a long compliance alone is like 71.4. It was pretty good. Um, then you can also calculate the resistance and stuff like that. But we're mostly interested when you have an esophageal balloon, not in the resistance, mostly in the compliance. So one again of the most important or mostly used uh, reason for um, putting an esophageal balloon is setting the peak. Again, I'm usually against PEEP FiO2 table, and I'm saying it loud, um, so that I don't get assassinated at some point. Um, uh, but to be more physiologic, the idea of PEEP is when the lung inflates, when it when it deflates during exhalation, it doesn't close. So you don't want the uh, alveolar pressure to be less than the pleural pressure, because it will open in exhalation, and if outside is more than inside, it will collapse. So idea is to keep um, the, uh, the, uh, the, the alveoli open, so is to keep the transpulmonary pressure above zero during end expiratory uh, pause. Um, usually people aim for zero, zero minus or plus two, usually try to get it above zero. So if you look at that patient on the left here, I know we didn't put a pause, but let's assume that there is a pause. Uh, you know, because I, I didn't put the flow here, so you don't know if there is a problem. But the uh, end expiratory, so the PEEP here is uh, 4.2, and the esophageal pressure is 6.4, so you're ending up with an end expiratory uh, pressure, transpulmonary pressure of minus 2. So basically, the alveoli will close during exhalation. So what you do, you adjust your PEEP, uh, you increase it here to about 10, I guess. Um, now, look at the difference here, you'll find your end expiratory transpulmonary pressure on the bottom is like 1.6. So you're assuming that the pressure inside the alveoli is higher than the pleural pressure and should not be. Uh, this is actually a cool small uh, case study we did like years ago, but I just wanted to tell you like even in APRV, there is a lot of debate about APRV and the T low. I'm not going to go through this for right now. Um, but we were able to actually win. Nobody knows how much O2 peep we're creating during APRV. It's usually have hazard, and people set it like according to percent of the flow decay, whatever. So it's like, okay, let's put an esophageal balloon, let's do that expiratory pause, and maybe we can set, we kept adjusting the T low, the time low, increase it, increase it until that transpulmonary pressure and expiratory becomes zero. So it's the same concept. And actually, I think in my mind, this probably is a better way. Uh, that's the only study done about. Now, okay, does doing this, um, yeah, 
doing this, uh, setting the peep according to the esophageal pressure, does it help, right? We are always suckers for mortality. Uh, we always look, if things improve mortality, great, we're gonna do it. If it doesn't improve mortality, we're just gonna throw it in the trash. And, you know, it's, it's really sad because it's not all about mortality. There's so many different things. So back in 2008, which actually, um, some people published in the New England Journal of Medicine, a study about the trial uh, guiding the, um, uh, the PEEP by the esophageal balloon. And if you can see, the only thing that came positive is actually mortality improved by this technique. And I think, I think that what gave the esophageal this it improves mortality right so that's called the ep vent one trial unfortunately like anything in critical care i can show you one study improving mortality the other one doesn't improve mortality so the ep vent two trial actually was like a bigger trial a little bit uh, 100 patients in each arm um they did they did the same thing according to the ppi2 table and you can see there is no change in mortality so if i put an esophageal balloon and try to do this yes somebody can come and tell me well, why are you doing this? You can just set according to the PPFIO2 table uh, because whatever you're doing is, does not improve mortality. I'm sure there will be EP event third trial that shows who knows what is going to show. But just to be honest, like about the evidence. Um, now we talked about the, the transpulmonary driving pressure, um, which is the difference between the end inspiratory transpulmonary pressure and the end expiratory transpulmonary pressure. You always hear about keep your driving pressure 15 because that that's the airway pressure. So most of the studies showed again, if you look here on the top um, second, uh, sorry, the third uh, graph here, that's a plateau pressure minus, uh, and you have the end, uh, inspiratory transpulmonary pressure. Usually if you keep that transpulmonary driving pressure around 12, 15, nobody knows the exact number, probably the lower the better, but usually around 12, that might have actually was associated with some mortality benefits. Um, so again, this is the stress, what the pressure the lung is seeing, not the chest wall or the diaphragm. How can it help me also to, again, we always talk about recruitability. Is that lung recruitable? If I do PEEP and do prone and recruitment maneuver, is my lung gonna improve and open and be good? Or the PEEP is not doing anything if I just jacked it up? or what it will be doing is over distension and some good alveoli worsening hemodynamics. So if you look at that person on the left side, this is a person who's so non-lung recruitable. So this is, we're not measuring the airway pressure. It's the transpulmonary pressure on the x-axis versus the tidal volume. So this person does not have any hysteresis, does not have any inflection curves, so he's not good. If you look at the one in the middle, now you can see the inflection points from below and up. You can see big hysteresis. This person, based on that curve, he probably will benefit from recruitment maneuver and from increasing the PEEP and everything. The third one, we just put an inspiratory pause or hold at the end for like 10 seconds, and you can see the difference between the volume at the end of the maneuver, then you put the pause and it went up to the long opened with the pressure. So when you put pressure, it becomes like the, um, the popcorn in the microwave, like the alveoli start to open. So this person is recruitable and the gel balloon can help me. Um, okay, I'm going to try to go a little bit faster here. Uh, effect of prone positions. Some interesting studies just to see, like, uh, what the, measuring the compliance of the chest wall with the prone position. What does prone position does for us? It should improve the lung compliance if you're improved, if you're recruitable, but it can worsen the chest wall compliance because instead of your supine and your chest is expanding, now your chest is um, sitting on the bed and cannot expand very well. Um, this is another one, and uh, it's just an interesting, but we don't have time to talk about uh, Trendelenburg with, uh, during cloning. How, okay. uh, another important way that um, Sujel Balloon can really help us is to measure the real work of breathing. Um, I always hear it, right? And if you know me, like, you'll say, oh, he had increased work of breathing. And me being uh, a pill saying, oh, how much, how many joules or whatever. And it's like, oh, no, we don't know. So to measure real work of breathing, you need to have an esophageal balloon to get that Campbell curve, um, get the, you know, the pressure time product um, and all this uh, PMOS. The only way to do it uh, is 
having an esophageal balloon. There's some surrogates for it, but this is the most obvious. Um, can it help during weaning? You bet. Uh, so this is a nice, very nice trial from ATS. Um, comparing the esophageal balloon swings, the pleural pressure swings, compared to the uh, RSBI, the Rapid Shallow Breathing Index. So if you look at that one patient to the left, that's a guy who uh, failed the weaning trial and get to be reintubated. So if you look at his esophageal uh, swings, pressure swings over time, 10 minutes, 20 minutes, 30 minutes, this guy going from like, say, 8 up to like 15, very big swings. So he failed. And that guy on the right, the boss RSBI is good. Asynchronous, I think that is the gold standard of uh, helping with asynchronous. And asynchronous is a big, difficult problem. So if you're looking here at the airway pressure, it's like, oh, there's an extra one coming from somewhere. There's some flow. Is that a patient triggered or mistriggered? Uh, so not mistriggered. Is it double triggered or patient triggered? If you don't have an osophageal balloon, you might struggle with this. But look at the, the osophageal pressure during that, um, that uh, extra pressure. You will find that the patient, no, the osophageal pressure was high. This is not patient induced. So the patient didn't take extra uh, breath, so it made this, so paralyzing him is not going to help, or increasing sedation is not going to help. This is probably double triggered by, by something else. Okay. Um, all right, we're going to go to auto trigger. Oh, so this is, a, sorry, an auto triggered breath that could be by the heart rate, by some, uh, by any other. So this is a double trigger. Again, you can see the difference between the first uh, airway pressure and the second and the flow and everything. But here, if you look at the osophageal balloon, the patient start breathing, so he triggers that first breath nicely. The ventilator stopped giving the breath and uh, cycle to exhalation. But if you look at the osophageal balloon, the patient is still doing effort. So what happened is the patient is still sucking air, so the ventilator gave him another one. So that's a double trigger. For what, many reasons for double trigger, we're not going to go through this right now. Um, this is one we always see it. Missed triggers, uh, usually in auto people weak, you know, you would find like the patient, you, you, sometimes it's very subtle, you might miss it in the airway pressure at the arrows and the flow, you might miss it. But if you look at the osophageal balloon, the patient is trying to breathe, but the ventilator is not giving him any breath. So this is usually due to auto peep and it causes a lot of uh, an anxiety. And when you can't, when you're trying to take a breath and you can't, your brain is not happy. Um, so you have to figure out why that is happening and you try to fix it. Um, this is some asynchronous early cycle. Again, if you're looking at the ventilator alone, you have no idea. It's like, uh, maybe the flow here, there's, there's a bump here, right? But without the esophageal balloon, if you look at the esophageal balloon, again, the patient is still breathing, ending his breath at that white line, but the ventilator already said, no, I'm done. Uh, I cycle to exhalation. I'm not going to give you another. Again, causing a problem. Look at the middle one, that's a perfect one. The patient would look at the social pressure, it went down and started relaxing exactly at the time where the ventilator is cycling from inhalation to exhalation. The opposite in that last one, the ventilator still keep going, but the patient already is like, oh, I'm done here. But it's like, nope, sorry, you're still getting what my master told me, um, the eye timer. Um, all right, let's go faster a little bit. Okay, something called trans alveolar, sorry, we always talk about the trans pulmonary pressure. Could that help me in hemodynamics? Yes. The same idea of like the, what's inside the alveoli and what's outside the alveoli happens with the heart. What's inside the heart and what's outside of the heart? What's inside the vessels? So for example, here we're measuring CVP or pulmonary artery wedge pressure and it's 15, right? Does it, and we always, you'd hear it, try to measure it at the end of exhalation because that's the lowest pressure inside the chest, but how much is pressure is inside the chest? We never take, no, well, not, not nobody. We always never, uh, you know, um, look at this. But if you look at that patient here, he has his uh, pleural pressure here is uh, four, uh, and the CVP is 15. So you have to convert the, the CVP from millimeter mercury to centimeter water, so it's almost 0.73. So that guy has trans um, vascular pressure of 12. Versus that guy and the person, same CVP or same watch pressure, but his pleural pressure is minus three. So you do the math and become 17. 
So sometimes people are in people of 20 or 25 and their wedge pressure is like 30 and oh my God, their volume overload. Then you do the transvascular pressure. It's like, no, the difference is really like only five. That's even less than normal. So we have to take care of this. I'm going to skip the, rec the next one. Okay, so there is no chance we can go through this. Um, it will be in the handout. Basically, it's some evidence uh, about the benefit of the um, of the osophageal pressure, the osophageal pressure um, monitoring, to basically change of tidal pressure, the transpulmonary uh, pressure, and the inspiratory uh, transpulmonary pressure and the expiratory. We talked about all of those, setting the PEEP uh, uh, and all the things. So you can and. The reference is down here. All right, very uh, five minutes. I'm gonna have to talk about volumetric capnometry. Uh, most of us use in the ICU or in the anesthesia the regular time versus end uh, tidal CO2. This is different because now we're measuring plotting the vo the expired CO2 versus the expired tidal volume. So we're doing real volumetric capnometry. Why is it important? Because it will compromise for me how much dead space. And we know that the whole tidal volume could be divided into physiologic dead space and alveolar tidal volume. So look at the bottom here, tidal volume versus physiologic and alveolar. Okay, even in alveolar tidal volume, which we are really interested in alveolar tidal volume. To be honest with you, who cares about the tidal volume that's wasted in our airways and in ET tube? And uh, who cares? It's not going inside the lung. What we're interested in is the dead space, the alveolar tidal volume. Um, so it gives us plots. You can see, of course, we all know the phases one, two, and three. I'm not going to go through them. Uh, so area two is the dead space. Area X is the CO2 uh, under the curve. Um, what information, again, it tells us? It tells me the VDAW, which is the airway, uh, the dead space of the airways. Um, I am interested, again, in the V alveoli, tidal volume going into the alveoli. Now, to make things more complicated, and I'm going to talk this about a second, even the tidal volume inside the alveoli, it doesn't mean that it's all perfused, right? Because we have some vasoconstriction. So some of the tidal volume inside the alveoli is dead space. And the minute ventilation. And it tells us something very important called VCO2. I'm going to try to touch uh, about, I'm not going to go through all of this, but VCO2 is basically the amount of CO2 you're producing per minute. And it gives you a lot of information about if you look here, what increases your VCO2 is you're increasing uh, your production. So you could be in sepsis, fever, somebody giving you bicarb, seizures, whatever. What decreases it, of course, is decreased uh, tidal volume um, um, or hypothyroidism, hypothermia, and stuff like that. Those are the normal tidal volume. We have, uh, sorry, normal values. Our normal dead space 2.2 milliliter per kg. VCO2 2.6 to 2.9 milliliter per minute per kg, and our normal tidal uh, minute alveolar ventilation. Quickly, by just looking at this, um, we can diagnose uh, long problems. So this is the dash, dotted part is the normal one, and that's a guy with an ARDS. How do I know it's ARDS? The first phase is very prolonged, so that's um, big uh, uh, dead space, and you can see the curve here. That's like phase three. How about the patient in uh, number two? That's a guy with COPD, right? You can see phase three is going to the roof. There is really not phase three. Uh, that guy in the, in the bottom here is a patient with pulmonary embolism. Talked about it like the, with the EIT. You can just suggest that the patient probably having PE because he was normal here, and all of a sudden his dead space increased. His uh, phase two, like that slope, because of the cardiac output worsen, became low, and the PECO2 uh, went down. So it could really diagnose a lot of things. Um, you can set the PEEP according to the PCO2, uh, VCO2. You can see here, this is somebody going incremental PEEP, and the VCO2 goes up and goes down, goes up. Once it goes down, like here at PEEP 16 uh, to 18, it means, OK, you over the stuff. Time to go back to the, to the norm, uh, to your previous PE. This is a, pers a person with, um, who was in too much PEEP, and you drop, and he was dotted here. And you see that space high, you drop it down and he become better. Versus this, the opposite, this is before a recruitment maneuver, 
uh, the end tidal was low, the dead space was big, you did the recruitment maneuver and the CO2 uh, improved. All right, one more, um, one more minute and I promise I'll be done. Um, can it help me in weaning? Yes, uh, the people who fail weaning, of course they have high end tidal CO2 at the end of the spontaneous breathing trial. Their VCO2 goes down and they, of course their dead space gets worsened. Um, again, the same idea, I'm going to skip through this, but uh, it just tells you the relationship between the end tidal CO2 and the VCO2, what increases it and what decreases it. Uh, please read it in the handout. Sorry, I didn't have much time. I was going to talk about this. This is a very cool thing that we did uh, with Dr. Frank, who's here. Uh, we, by combining that uh, alveolar tidal volume, measuring the alveolar tidal volume from the volumetric capnometer. Because we always measure compliance, as you met, um, looked before, with the total tidal volume. But again, this tidal volume is a lot of it, almost one third or maybe even more in the ARDS is wasted into our airway, like from in the dead space. Do we care about this? No. So we took, we able to calculate that alveolar tidal volume versus the, um, uh, the, the transpulmonary pressure. And that's basically now we're able to not only get the lung compliance, but able to get the alveolar compliance. Um, I thought this paper was going to like change the whole respiratory thing, but so far nothing. So, um, okay, can it help me in the in the ER or in the ICU about other stuff than non-respiratory? Can it help with fluid responsiveness? Yes, there is a study that shows the change in the entitled CO2 and the VCO2 actually could determine who is uh, fluid responsive versus not. Similar like EIT, it can actually gives you measure of cardiac output according to the FIC principle. All right, what else can it help me with? Uh, if you calculate the VCO2, it's almost like having a metabolic part. So you can calculate the energy expenditure. So that's called the modified Weir's equation. And, based, and our actually new uh, dietitian in the hospital now do this. They look at the VCO2 calculate and it's like, oh, that patient needs this, may, how much calories. Okay, some evidence be, uh, behind it, again, uh, would be helpful in ARDS, pulmonary embolism, healthy patients, elective surgery, thoracic surgery, please read it. And with this, I will tell you, thank you so much for your uh, patience with me. And we have actually...